Hey everybody, welcome back. In today's video, we're gonna look at some Aperion loudspeakers. Uh, these were recently brought in by a customer. He brought in all three of these, so he's got a whole home theater system using these things. And I don't hear that much buzz about this company on the net. So this is a one that's kind of new to us. I've not had any anybody ask me if we've upgraded these or anything like that. So relatively new. Um, of course, I told the customer, yeah, bring it in. We'll be glad to take a look at whatever you want us to take a look at. And that's at the stage we're in right now. So you're kind of getting in in the middle on this one. The customer won't be in until tomorrow. And I'll go over all of this with the customer and we'll decide what to do. But as of right now, it's in the stage where we've measured and tested it. We've done some evaluation and I'm going to share some of that evaluation with all of you guys. And then we have to decide, uh, you know, what, what are the options? What, what can be done? What can we fix? What can we not fix? And then it's up to the customer. It's you guys, whoever sends me this stuff to decide, what do you want me to do with it? So that's where we are right now. Let's take a look and let's dive into this stuff. This is the Aperion Intimus product line and they brought in a tower center channel and a little stand mounted version and first thing we did was just set these things up and start taking measurements and just see what's going on and there were some obvious problems with these and let's just start with the tower and go through these things and let's look at what's here and what I've got to work with then maybe I'll do a follow-up video and we'll see what did the customer decide to do because there's definitely some options. Let's look at um, this thing. It's a it's a two-way. It uses two of these six and a half inch woofers. Um, they're shielded, which is odd these days. We don't see a lot of shielded. It's basically a paper-based cone. Um, it looks kind of like it's got some kind of carbon fiber lay, but it's really feels kind of like a paper based comb. It's very stiff. Um, cast frame. I've seen these frames before. I think I know where these come from. Nothing fancy going on here. And it's got a little soft dome tweeter and it's, it's definitely just a two way design. Now, first thing we need is to do the frequency response on it. And let's, let's look at that. Let's look at the frequency response. And the first thing that stands out is there's a big lump there right at about 1k hertz it's there's a peak there so first thought is okay is that peak an amplitude peak is it just a rise in amplitude or is there something else going on is there stored energy there is there ringing going on there so immediately we'll flip it over into the spectral decay and see what it's doing and if you followed one of my latest videos on spectral decays hopefully you guys understand what this is showing let's throw it up there and let's look at it you see that big hump at 1k hertz and you see that long ridge line coming way out there. That is some stored energy there. That is something that will be very audible. Um, if I design something new for this thing, you know, first of all, I'd probably turn it into a two and a half way design. So the acoustic centers are this far apart instead of this far apart, which would improve the vertical off axis a lot. But can I fix that? Now, I know I could put a notch filter on there and bring the amplitude levels down, even make it a somewhat suppressed there, a dipped a little instead of a peak. So it's kind of like taking that ringing and turning that ringing down three or four dB. I could do that, but it's still going to be ringing right there. There's no fixing that. That is a problem within the design. There could be a number of things causing it. It could be st some stored energy within the woofer itself. Uh, it could be a contributing factor that they don't radius the back side of these through holes. That always causes a little whoop de doo right there in that region because we're getting diffraction off the inside edge of that. But in this case, I think it's more driver related. Um, definitely something that would be hard to fix. Also, let's look at the impedance curve. Let's throw that up and you'll notice that it does drop to 4.3 ohms. Now, if I were redesigning it in a two and a half way, it would be a higher impedance load as it reaches the tweeter, but as as it goes low, they would still be in parallel. There's really not much fix in that. Uh, using a good quality air core inductor may bring it up a little, but it's gonna be in the four ohm range. 
Let's look at the horizontal off axis and you can see it drops off pretty well. Uh, nothing crazy going on there. Uh, and the vertical off axis, if we look at it, it actually is not bad for a tweeter that's crossed to two drivers, but there's still a pretty good little suck out in that region. Now, sometimes when we see stuff like this, where we see a big hump and we're thinking, man, why would they let that go out like that? You know, and I'll look online sometimes to see if there's other measurements of it out there. In this case, Stereophile measured this thing quite some time ago. And on their measurements, it didn't, it didn't have that big of a hump there, but there was a hump there. Um, and it didn't show up as bad in the stored energy as what mine did. However, they, they do something that I don't do. Uh, John Atkinson puts an accelerometer on the cabinet and he measures cabinet wall resonances. And this one was as bad as I've ever seen of any of his measurements. It was really ringing. And so I thought, well, uh, let's take a look at that. <laughs> you know, let's set this thing back up and we'll hit it with some test tones. And you can tell, you can put your hand on the cabinet and you know when it's really ringing. And in the low frequency ranges, the cabinets were just really flexing. I mean, flexing a lot. And we got up there to about the 280 mark. That's where John Atkinson showed a significant ring. It lit up like a Christmas tree, man. I mean, whoo, bumblebee buzzing. It was a lot of buzzing. So... We pulled the woofer out and looked inside, and there's not a brace in this thing. And this is a pretty deep speaker. I mean, we're talking a deep speaker, big panels, no bracing. And from the fill of the sidewalls here, I'm guessing mm, not real thick. Um, it might be three-quarter inch material. I'm going to say it's three-quarter inch material, but it's with no bracing on it or anything. Oh. Man, is it ringing. This is one of those situations where it's pretty on the outside. Not so much on the inside. And if we look at the crossover parts, we, we took a picture of the crossover. We'll throw that up. Super cheese. Cheesy parts. Um, so this is one of those that's just, wow, can I fix this? I don't know. There's a lot I could fix about it. You could line this with no res. This is the kind of speaker no res helps more than any other speaker, that's for sure. But it's going to take some work to try and turn this into something. Let's look at the center channel. It measured the best out of the three. Still, there's a big hump in the response. Right at around five or 600 hertz there. Uh, it's pretty choppy. Uh, at least... It's crossing over somewhere in that range to this little mid underneath it. So because it's a tweeter mid, the horizontal off axis was pretty good. Um, a weird thing or two though, they've got it's got a switch on the back that drops the bottom end up or down a little bit. So it attenuates the bottom end. Uh, from the measurements I'm showing, what they did was they they allowed you to click a resistor in line with the woofers to bring the woofer level down if you need to. That is a horrible idea. That just puts a resistor in line with your woofers. Now your power handling is limited to the wattage rating of the resistor. Stupid. Um, so let's look at what it did here. If you look at the this measurement, you can see how it dropped the lower end out of it a little bit, which makes the differential between the lower end and that peak even worse. Um, horizontal off axis looks okay. I mean, it's still it's a choppy ride, but nothing bad's going on in the horizontal you've got good coverage and in the vertical off axis it's fine looking at the spectral decay there is some stored energy going on right there at that peak down there where that woofer's playing and it could be um this woofer just has a peak higher up and the crossovers pulled what it's reaching higher up out of it but it's left it's left it a little bit in that range so Pretty bad, and if you look at the impedance curve, um, it drops to three and a half ohms. When you engage that resistor, it brings it up a little bit, but keep in mind, if you're hooking these up to a receiver, it's gonna be very taxing on that receiver. It's gonna really ask for some current for that thing. A lot of these new little home theater receivers don't like a bunch of four ohm speakers ganged up on it. Horrible idea to create low impedance loads on all of these things. I don't know why they're doing stuff like that. Um, pretty on the outside. 
Not a lot of thought going into the inside and it got worse. I saved this one for last. This is the little bookshelf model. And this is one of those deals. Hobbs was over there shooting the measurements while I was at, while I was doing work over at my desk. And, and I could hear what was going on. You can hear the measurements sound like this. And I've heard those so many times. I could pretty much just hear that and I could draw a line and graph out the frequency response. And this in this situation, I heard it and I went, I said, whoa, that didn't sound too good. And he said, no, it did not. And he's looking at the, the response there on the screen. And I go over and look at it. And here's what I see. Let's look at the frequency response. There's a huge hole between the tweeter and the woofer. And his first thought was, and it would be mine as well, maybe they wire the tweeter out of phase. You know, when you wire the drivers out of phase, they create a big hole in the response. So he went in, pulled the tweeter out, flipped the polarity, put it back in, shot another response. And here's what happened. Ta-da! Yeah, it's even worse. It's It got even worse when we flipped the polarity. So what's that? And it when we do a polarity flip like that, what we're looking for is we're looking for it to sum perfectly flat. And then when we flip the polarity, we're looking for it to make a 15 dB hole in the response. That tells us that when we have it correct, that it's in phase, that everything is arriving at the correct time arrival. In this case, they're about 80 degrees out of phase with the tweeter one way, and when you flip the tweeter polarity the other way, they're about 110 degrees out of phase. So they're not in phase at all, and that's causing that big hole. Whoever did the crossover work on this may, must have calculated electrically. They didn't look at the acoustic output of this thing. It is a mess. Also, we notice sensitivity is really low. It averages about 82 dB, and it's peaking. Um, the peak on it at the tweeter in there hit about 86, and it's about 74 dB right there at that dipped area. So there's a 12 dB spread right there within a range of the lower range of the tweeter to the top end of the tweeter. That's pretty rough. And... Um, Hobbs dropped down and took one on woofer axis to see if it got better on woofer axis. We'll take a look at that one. It did not get any better. So let's look at uh, the horizontal off axis. It drops off pretty evenly. I'm not seeing problems there, but then again, there was already a huge hole. Um, vertical off axis, as we went up vertically, it got worse. The drivers went ahead and got more out of phase. Uh, if we look at the spectral decay, we can see there is some stored energy in this little woofer's response. It's shifted over a little bit from what we measured in the tower, but there is some stuff going on there. Uh, some of it is in an area where there's a dipped area, and so we're seeing uh, it drop off and then some come back. So that could be a couple of things causing that, but pretty rough. If you look at the impedance curve, it's 8 ohms, so... Well, work's cut out for me on these if the customer decides for us to try and do something with this. Um, I'm definitely going to have to go in and redesign everything and fix all these problems. Um, crossover quality was really poor on these. Let's look at the crossover on this one. Cheesy parts. Again, pretty on the outside, beautiful box. <sighs> Not much going on the inside. A little, real lack of engineering. I'm really disappointed with what I've seen across the board here with all of these three models. I don't know yet what I'm going to do. Um, this may be one of those deals where the customer decides this is just not worth it. It's time to punt, you know, sell these in the used market, take a loss on them, get rid of them, start over, build some of our kits, something that doesn't have this kind of problem, or there may be an emotional attachment to these things. I don't know. They're, you know, they're really pretty. His, his wife may really like them and he wants me to turn them into something. We can do that. I can fix a lot of these problems. May not can fix all these problems, but we'll see what we can do. A Perion, not that impressed so far. Not that impressed. Um, that's it for this video. We'll see you guys in the next one.